Hello, everyone, and welcome to week uh, 13 of an introduction to agent-based modeling. Uh, so this will be the second to last uh, office hour I'll be doing uh, since we'll be wrapping up next week. Uh, I will be doing one on um, September 5th. Unfortunately, my uh, normal time slot of 11 a.m., um, I actually have a dentist appointment at that time, so I am uh, going to move it back uh, to uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, which might be a little late for anyone in Europe, uh, but I'll do my best to, uh, that it's the last one and it'll be up on the recordings and everything like that, so hopefully um, that will work out so that you will see it, okay? So next week, September 5th, will be our last office hour together. Um, and that will be at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I'll I'll post the announcement about that. Um, uh, well, when I send out the email next week, I will make sure to note that as well during the email. Um, make a note of that just so I remember. 14 email. Okay. Um, office hours at 1 p.m. on Tuesday. Okay. Um, so what's going on this week? Well, going on this week, all the videos are now up and live. They have been uh, for about a week now, right? Uh, but because I got the last couple up a little bit late, I did extend uh, the deadline of the entire course uh, by a week just to kind of give you all some more time to finish up the actual tests and exams. Um, so I believe, let me double check so I make sure I don't get this wrong. The last date of the course is now September 8th. Um, at midnight. So by September 8th at midnight, you have to complete all the exams. Now, the um, peer reviews are still going to be due um, this week, right? So the peer reviews um, are due later this week. They are due on September 1st at midnight, uh, Pacific time. Those are always Pacific time, uh, due dates. Um, so, um, so the, the, that will be Friday that they are due by, right? So you have to turn them in by Friday, okay? Um, so that's uh, the, the basic plan, right, uh, for what's going to go on uh, this week, okay? Um, so please turn in your final peer reviews. Uh, if you're having trouble finding them at all, right, uh, then you want to go to, uh, I believe it's called My Progress. Let me find out. Yeah, so it's on My Progress tab and click Peer Review Assignment for Unit 6 to find the reviews, right? Uh, the final uh, reviews um, are due uh, by, sorry, by August. Let me, wow, don't want to screw this up. By, uh, by September, yeah, September 1st. I had that right. September 1st. Pacific time, right? Um, oh, wait a second. I just realized that for some reason these times have all shifted. That's weird. Okay. Uh, for some reason it's actually, it was listed as August. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay. So, let me, let me apologize. I was wrong. It is due August 31st at midnight Pacific time. Um, I think something happened when, when we had a small glitch with the peer reviews uh, last week. I think it may have messed with my dates a little bit. So they're showing up as September 1st on my end, but it's because of the time zone. It's actually August 31st at midnight Pacific time. So let's just be absolutely clear about that. August 31st at midnight Pacific time, right? And then the course will end. Let me make sure I got this one right, too. Just so that it doesn't, hasn't, see, oh, it did change it. So the course will end September 7th at midnight Pacific time, if I am reading this correctly. So the course will end September, uh, it's doing everything, sorry, it's doing everything in, on Eastern Daylight. Oh, wait, okay. Okay. Huh. That is weird. Okay. So. So, oh, so it's showing me all these now in local times. I apologize. I think that the time things have been messed up a little bit. Okay. So the course will end on September 7th 
at at midnight Pacific time. That is correct. Okay, yes. So, which is the same, for some reason it's showing me as Eastern Daylight Time when it used to show me as Pacific Daylight Time, so I apologize. So the course will end, let's get this absolutely right, and I will put an announcement about this up um, just to make sure that I have this all set up correctly, right? The course will end on September 7th at midnight Pacific time. And the exam is, sorry, the final peer reviews are due August 31st at midnight Pacific time, okay? Got that one? So September 7th at midnight Pacific time and August 31st at midnight Pacific time. And I will post an announcement with those dates just to remind everyone, okay? Um, yeah, sorry, just the, 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 the way that I have to convert between UTC and EDT and PDT and all this it got me a little confused there, so I apologize for that. Uh, okay, so those now we've got the dates straightened out, which should be the least of every year. I do want to apologize again. You all saw the emails, uh, both from Julia and from me. Uh, apparently, there was a small glitch with peer reviewing. Uh, somehow the date was showing up as past, and then there weren't any peer reviews showing up and things like that. And it, in fact, for me, it's still showing up as past. But if I go into through my demo view that I have, but if I go in through the my progress, I can see that the there's still reviews there to do. Right. Uh, so make sure you complete your reviews. Now, you know we have it all set up now. Um, and all the glitches have fixed. Um, you know these things happen occasionally. Um, especially the peer review system is fairly new. Um, but um, hopefully it'll all work out now. Um, the other big announcement that I had was that I wanted to tell you to go ahead and fill out the course evals, right? Um, and there are kind of, you know, two official ones and the one that we ask you to do if you enjoyed the course. Uh, so the two official ones are the one that I put together that's a Google form that you'll find in Unit 9 in the wrap-up section. Um, that basically just asks you specific questions about the course itself. Um, what's interesting is, you know, I asked you at the beginning if you're a programmer, I'm going to ask you again at the end. Um, it's always interesting to see what that shift is, see how people have changed their minds about whether or not they consider themselves programmers, right? Um, and then there's the other one, which is the Complexity Explorer eval, and that's like the one Complexity Explorer does to kind of fit this course in within its overall uh, Complexity Explorer package, right? Um, and so we we really ask you to fill both of those out, and then if you actually if you like the course, right, um, there is this website called uh, Class Central that is essentially kind of a Yelp for um, uh, for uh, MOOCs for massively open online courses. Uh, and so if you really like the course, we we kindly ask you uh, to go over and check out the MOOC, right, um, and and write us a review over there, right. Um, so um, this course gets pretty good reviews. Um, uh, it's uh, overall, and so uh, definitely uh, found uh, uh, you know go ahead and you know add to it if you feel like it, um, and kind of look, take it check it out. Okay, so um, those three reviews are the three we asked. We asked for the one review that's specific to this course, right? That helps me. Figure out what material is working, what material is not working. Um, you know, if and, and you know if there's any specific feedback. Um, by the way, if there's any specific feedback, you know, feel free to email me anytime. Uh, this is just a way for us to kind of comprehensively collect it on a similar set of questions. But if like you find a particular unit way too hard or a particular unit way too easy, um, let me know, right? And um, I want to try and modify the course over time. Uh, of course, you know. Because there's 1,800 students enrolled in the course, right? I can't really tailor the course to be a perfect fit for everyone, but I will do my best to kind of hit as much as much many of you as possible in the sweet spots, right? Um, and then so that we have the the one for the course, the one for Complexity Explorer, and then the one for Class Central as a whole. So um, please feel free to fill those out as you complete the course. Right? Okay. Um, so that's it I have for general announcements. I'm going to go into, I had a couple of questions come in, either on email or through the forum. And so I'm going to go ahead, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go through those. But if you have any questions, feel free to tweet at me or make a comment in uh, the YouTube space while I'm talking. Uh, and I will get back to you as soon as possible, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, so... 
Uh, there are a couple questions about level space. Um, there is a new video up on level space, so uh, let me bring up the net logo window and kind of show you that a little bit. Um, specifically, someone wanted to know about integrating a system dynamics model with level space, and unfortunately, I just saw this question late last night and uh, haven't really had a chance to play around with it too much, but you know, what the heck. Uh, the nice thing about computer modeling is we can try it out and see what happens. Uh, and hopefully something good will happen out of it, right? So they wanted to know if they could use a, um, a NetLogo system dynamics model within level space. Um, and uh, just a quick, so a quick comment. So level space, what does level space do, right? So level space allows you to basically load other uh, NetLogo models into a model. Right? And it's really kind of cool because um, it allows you to then execute certain models as kind of children models underneath another model. So I'm going to go into the code library, and so in models library, into code examples, and then into extension examples, and ls is level space. I'm going to load uh, the parent model example, right? And... Let me bring this up so you can see it. So because of the way um, OBS, Open Broadcasting Software, works, the software I use to stream to you, um, you're only going to see the main window. I can bring up the other window once it loads, but you won't see all the windows. So. Um, I mean, it's set up which just clears, basically that just clears the level space. And by the way, you know, I, I should go through this in the example just to reiterate, right? To, to load the level space, you just say extensions, level space, right? And then you can tell the level space to reset, which basically just destroys any of the children models you have. And then this particular example is going to create a child model. And it's going to do that by calling user file. And user file has you choose a file that you want to load, and then level space is just going to um, create a child model, which is a procedure, using the particular model path that you've chosen. Right? And it's going to create as an interactive model. Now, there's two types of children models in level space. There are um, interactive models and essentially batch models. And interactive models are models that will actually load another window and everything. Um, and then batch models are models that run kind of headless, if you think about it that way, right? Um, so I am going to go ahead and create a child model. I'm going to try and create, and I've never done this before. Let's see if it works. A systems dynamic child model. So, um, and so I'm going to pull up with sheet predation because that's kind of one of my favorites. And... Then I'm going to click Setup Models. Ah, yep. So it looks like Level Space may not work well. Let's see, let's try that again with um, System Dynamics Modeling. There may actually be a comment about that. Yep, I'm not seeing it. Let's see, let's see, make sure I'm not doing anything wrong here. So let's try another one. Yeah, it appears, um, uh, it does have that model there. Right? So that's interesting. It actually brings it up, as you can see. So I can, in level space, when I'm in level space, I can actually go to edit any of the open models, right, directly in the same tab as the parent. Um, and in this case, right, it shows me the code, but it doesn't show me the actual setup. And when then when I hit setup models, um, it's actually causing me a problem with the current one. So let's let's go ahead. Let me show you what it actually does when it's supposed to work correctly, right? Um, so let's create a child model, and I'll go ahead and choose another one. I'll choose. Um, 3D shapes example. Right. Right. Oh, hold on a second. 
trying to pull this up so you can see it. Okay. So. Okay. So it's not the best one, to do, but it'll work. Uh, whatever. Um, okay. So here I have, I brought up the child model. So I have, on um, the right side, I have the standard set up, right? For the parent model, and I have the right child model. And you can see I can hit setup models, which will set up. You can see that the background color, at least in the 3D shapes model, is changing. And I can go, and it, actually, this is another problem, right? In, in this particular model, so if we go back and we do level space, add open models, 3D shapes, right? Um, there is no go, right, in this particular one. So this is another problem with using level space. Like, you have to, like, so if we go down to the actual level space code, right? You see the ask level models to go, right? But in this one, it's actually not called go, it's called demo, right? Um, so what we can do, right, is, is instead of saying go, we can say demo, right, in our code. And then if we go back to the interface, we can't go, oh, wait, I have changed it. Oh, you know what? I wonder if, I'm going to split over here. Yeah, so <laughs> that's interesting. Why the go procedure isn't actually calling the go procedure. Okay, so it, it turns out, hmm. There we go. Okay. So this allows me to do it. Okay. So um, for some reason, and I have no idea, the go button in the parent model example is not actually calling the go procedure that is inside the, the, inf the procedure tab. Instead, it has its own code, uh, which let me show you. I, I actually have to add this in as another window. So edit. Okay. So when I first popped this window up, what it actually looked like was this, right? And because 3D Shapes doesn't have a go procedure, that was causing an error, right? So let's recreate that. Well, the error actually pops up a separate window. Uh, but if I want, right, I can edit that and I could instead type demo, which is actually if you go over to the 3D shapes code, right? That's actually the name of the fan, right? It's demo, right? Um, okay. And unfortunately, because the way the 3D shapes thing works, that looks really fast. So we can turn the speed slider. So you can actually control the speed slider of all the child models separately, right? So I can't go, right? And it will actually slowly, you can see it's actually slowly happening to the the uh, turtles do its little thing right okay and so um now this is interesting enough this is actually you know set up to do um the part of the reason why i said this example is a little weird oh, it actually works pretty well okay is because this this sub this child model is actually using the NetLogo 3D, um, and level space of course is assuming kind of more traditional structures and not 3D structures. But because the 3D view is actually just part of the edit window, it works okay. Of course, you're not seeing it because I have to edit that one in too. Give me one second, and I'll bring that one in. All right. So here we go. Okay. So now, right, I've got, 
I've got the parent model, right, that's over here, right, which is the one you're seeing um, when I hit set up models, I hit go, right? And then I also have the 3D view um, of, of the child model, right? And so, the, long story short, this took a little while to set up, but the point of level space is that I have one model controlling another model, right? Now, in this particular case, it's not terribly interesting because the 3D shapes model is just kind of a, you know, a, a demo model, right, that just shows things off. Um, but you can imagine that what if I had, like, a major model of a city and I had individual models of, like, neighborhoods, right? I could integrate those in such a way that I could have, like, a hierarchical ordering of the models, right? And so I could have parent models that created child children models and so forth, right? Um, unfortunately, it looks like it doesn't work really well with the systems dynamics model right now, um, and I'll have to look into a little bit more why that is, at least not the default ones that are in um, the, the, um, the NetLogo models library. It might have to do simply with just figuring out how to call the system dynamics models correctly. It might be that it is supporting them. Um, the, the way that this particular code snippet is set up, it's kind of assuming a standard setup in Go um, procedure, right? So if you don't have a setup in Go, then it's not going to work uh, uh, correctly, right? Um, so, uh, anyways, long story short, it's a cool new tool, right? Um, and if you want to read more about it, I highly recommend going over to the NetLogo documentation on Level Space, um, where you can read up a bunch about all the different things that you can possibly do with it, right? Um, so here is that, right? Um, and but essentially, the, the basic thing, right, and just to kind of get back, right, is that you have these models that you're just basically creating, right, and you can create 30 of them. You can, one of the nice things with the headless version, right, you could create 30 different versions of the same model, right, and run them simultaneously. And then you can ask those models to do certain things, right? Um, so in this case, they, they're configuring, in this example, they're configuring the graphs, right? And then you can ask them to do things like Go. And then you can actually get global values back from the models the same way you would get global values of an agent, uh, of, an, of a group of agents, right? Um, and so this is really, really cool, right? It lets you do intermodel interactions, allows you to have one model setting another model, right? In this case, they have the wolf sheet predation model and a climate change model. Um, you can actually have, uh, you know, the, the, the different models affecting each other, right? Um, and so this is, this is just really cool stuff. Um, it just came out, right? It just was released in NetLogo 6, which happened earlier this year. So not all the use cases are fully built out yet, right? Uh, but I think it's a very powerful way to allow you to add hierarchical modeling, uh, to NetLogo. Um, as I said, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare the exact example of system dynamics. It obviously wasn't working quite yet, um, but I will look into that some more and see what I can find out about that, okay? Okay, so um, let's see what else is going on this week. So another question I had was about, oh, running on Ubuntu and AWS, right? So a question came in that somebody said their model's really, really powerful and cool, uh, but their computer's not enough. They want to be able to run it in the cloud. I was like, that's awesome. That's really great. And I do that all the time. I actually, I haven't done it too much on AWS. Though I, have, I did try it out once to see if I could do it, right? Uh, normally, I run it on my own personal servers, uh, the compute servers that we have at the university, right? Um, and it works pretty well there. Um, and the big thing that you've got to remember, like, there isn't nothing special you have to do to run NetLogo on the cloud, right? Um, as long as your cloud environment is configured correctly, right? And so, essentially, um, if you're running on something like Ubuntu or on the cloud, you're probably going to be running headless more often than not, right? Um, and headless means that you are going to directly run the model from the command line without ever popping up a NetLogo window, right? Um, 
And so you're just going to execute, you're going to tell Net Logo to run a model and output some results. And more often than not, you're probably going to tell Net Logo to execute a behavior search, right? Um, uh, behavior space, sorry, experiment. Um, and, and then give you the results out, right? Uh, and so uh, we talked a little bit about this. I can bring up the code again, right? Uh, but if you look at some of the examples on experiments in, in, in some of the previous units, um, we, we basically uh, went through this. Let's, uh, let's see. Okay, so let me bring that window back up. So, um, you, you can run NetLogo using in the command line script, right? So on the Macs and Linux, there's a command called NetLogo headless. So Ubuntu is a Linux variant, so you would run it there. You then tell it what model you want. You tell it what experiment you want, right? And then it'll automatically run. So for instance, um, if you if you have an experiment called um, up real quick. If you have an experiment called experiment one that is in the fire.n logo file, right, then this command will automatically output it, right, to the results, right? Um, and you can actually give, you can actually override like the world commands and things like that, so you can give it specific commands, right? And then most importantly, you can output it to, you can output the data to particular files, right? Um, and, you know, I tend to use the table output. Right, um, and output the data that way, and then I could pull in the data to my favorite, um, a, uh, uh, my favorite statistical analysis package, which for me is usually R, right, and then I can analyze the results of the model there. Okay, um, so there's nothing special you'd have to do to run the model on AWS the, beyond the standard, and a AWS, by the way, stands for Amazon Web Services, it's Amazon's cloud computing solution. Um, there's nothing special you'd have to do to get the model running there. Um, you just have to make sure you have an, uh, a Linux environment set up and one where you can um, uh, where you can install NetLogo. Now, that's assuming that you're going to run all of the NetLogo experiments on one machine, right? Um, so some super powerful machine that you're just borrowing from AWS for a while, right? If you were going to run the experiments on multiple machines, right, there is no native distribution set up for NetLogo, right? Uh, there's no way to automatically distribute it among many machines, right, for a particular experiment. So what I recommend you do is you actually create a set of experiments that are themselves distributed solutions, right? Because NetLogo, a lot of times, you actually don't want to run the same simulation across multiple machines. You want to run... 20 simulations here, 20 simulations on machine two, 20 simulations on machine three, and so forth, right? So you can do that by just designing your experiment well, right? So let's say you have, for instance, four variables that you're gonna alter, right? Then you come up with some base set value for each of those four variables, and then on each of the machines, you alter one of them, right? So, you know, variable one, you go from one to 10 on machine one, variable two, you go from one to 10 on machine two, variable three, you go from one to 10 on machine three, and so forth, right? And that way you can run, you know, 40 experiments at the same time it would normally take you to run 10 experiments, right? Um, so that would be the way to kind of handle scaling up, right? Um, so I think that's really all the questions I had this week. Um, as you're wrapping up unit nine, right, things are kind of starting to slow off, slow down. I want to thank everyone who has already, I, I, you, by the way, I mentioned at the top about um, uh, uh, the fact that um, the feedback forms, I've already gotten a bunch of feedback from people, so please feel free to keep sending feedback. I would highly like that, right? Um, so, uh, uh, please, please, please send additional uh, uh, feedback as you do it. Um, this week, by the way, just a reminder again, August 31st and midnight Pacific time is when your peer reviews are due. And September 7th and midnight Pacific time is when the course will officially close. So you need to have all of your exams done by then in order to get the certificate, right? Um, so yeah, so um, that's it for this week, basically. Uh, please fill out the peer. Please fill out your 
the, well, do fill out your peer review assignment for sure. We also fill out the class reviews, both the Complexity Explorer one, uh, the agent-based modeling one, uh, the specifics of this course, and uh, the class central review. Uh, if you have any questions in the interim, uh, please let me know. Um, and please check out the video on level space. Let me know if it's hitting at the right levels or not, <laughs> um, or if I need to make it more detailed or more complex um, than uh, what it's currently in there, okay? Um, and I will look into, for the person who asked, I don't have the notes right here in front of me, the person who asked about system dynamics modeling and level space, I'll look into that a little bit more um, and see if I can maybe get an answer next week, okay? So next week's finals office hours too, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, on Tuesday. Uh, let me know uh, if you have any last questions. Thank you so much, everybody. You know, 1,900 students almost. Uh, it's been great. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you guys have put together in your final projects. Take care.